All right. To be able to predict what humans are going to do in the future, or to be able to predict Earth's future climate, we need to know something about what happened in the past. And so by studying the past, we learn about the present, but we also gain an ability to predict the future. And that really is the, the goal of paleoceanography, to look at the past, see what's happened, and to try to understand, in the context of what we're doing today, what might happen in the future. So I can't emphasize how important it is for us to study ocean sediments, to learn about Earth's past, to be able to look at periods of time when humans weren't present on the planet, and to try to make inferences about what we're doing now and what the possible consequences might be. This is so important that oceanographers have built ships especially dedicated to the drilling and obtaining of sediments on the seafloor. One of the earliest expeditions was something called the Glomar Challenger. So deep sea drilling began in 1968. Um, the Joides Resolution continued that work on up to 19, uh, or from 1983. And then just in 2007, international efforts began to study seafloor sediments with the building of the Japanese drill ship Chikyu, and this is what it looks like. So here's the drilling platform, and oceanographers are taking these vessels out to sea, stationing them over a part of the seafloor, drilling and obtaining long, mile-long cores in some cases, and bringing them back and studying them, storing them and studying them, and trying to infer or trying to figure out what happened in Earth's past. Here's a drill rig, and this is from the uh, Glomar Challenger, I believe. It could be from the Joyce Resolution. You can check out the website linked here. Here's what a drill rig looks like, and maybe you'd like to have a job working on a drill rig, drilling for ocean sediments and studying Earth's past. So this apparatus drills down into the seafloor. More pipes added to it as they continue to drill deeper and deeper. This is what it looks like in the middle of the ship. And this, as this uh, pipe is sent down to the seafloor, here you can see this is like a moon pool in the middle of the ship. And then when the cores are brought on board, they, they come in a plastic case. And so the first thing oceanographers do after bringing these on board and wiping them down and cleaning them up a little bit is they split them in two. So here we have a saw, and we're just taking these plastic tube full of sediments now, which may be, again, hundreds or thousands of feet deep, and splitting it in two. And you can see, even in this picture here, the different bands of sediments. Here we have light-colored sediment that's surrounded by dark-colored sediment, and that tells us that something changed during that period of time. So this may represent thousands of years. And it's through the studies of seafloor sediments by taking small samples, by examining the kinds of organisms or fossils that may be present in there, by looking at the size of the sediments and the types of grains and all those different kinds of things that we'll talk about in just a little bit. Here's the ocean's memory. It's the history of the earth as revealed through sediment cores. Okay, now let's step back a bit. But Okay, now let's step back a bit and look at how oceanographers or how paleontologists classify ocean sediments. How do they, what do they look at when they bring a sediment on board? How do we know one sediment from another, so to speak? Okay, well, let's think about where sediments might come from. First of all, just pounding on a rock creates little fragments of rock. So those are rocky sediments and rocky sediments are called lithogenous sediments. They come from the earth. And rocks, as you may or may not know, can be igneous, meaning they're volcanically derived. They may be metamorphic, which means they were put under great temperature and pressure at some depth in the earth and spewed back out on top of the earth. Or they may be sedimentary rocks. So sediments can even come from sedimentary rocks. Sediments may also originate from organisms. A seashell is a really good example of an organism that produces a shell that can break apart and then be part of the sediments, okay? They might also form from chemical processes. So if you leave a pan of salt water out and it dries up, it forms little crystals of salt. That's an example of a chemical sediment. The kinds of 
black smoker towers that you find on hydrothermal vents are another example of a chemical sediment. And believe it or not, sediments can even come from outer space. Our Earth is constantly being bombarded by cosmic dust and micrometeorites and occasionally even larger meteorites. And these supply a small percentage of sediments that we find on the seafloor. So again, identifying and understanding the origins, transport, depositional processes of sediments is going to be carried out or is going to occur by understanding how we can tell something about all these different kinds of sediments that we just talked about. If we take a sort of overview at the sources of sediments in the ocean, here we go. Volcanoes produce rocks, the parent rocks break down, they may break down through wind and water, they may break down through glaciers, those sediments can then be carried by rivers and streams into lakes or they may be carried into the ocean. The sediments may be deposited here in lakes. The lakes may evaporate, leaving chemicals behind and altering the sediments. We all know sand at the beach. That's probably the most common form of sediment that most of us are familiar with. Those sediments may be reworked by waves and again in river processes. Those sediments may be carried out onto the continental shelf. They may slide down a submarine canyon through turbidity currents. So here we're already using some of the things we learned in the previous chapter. Sediments may be blown by the winds and deposited in seawater where they may sink down to the seafloor. All those things can happen in continental environments and providing a source of sediments for the ocean. We can also take a look at biological activity and we'll spend a good deal of our time this semester talking about biological processes. But we also want to think about while we're studying those biological processes how they produce sediments in the form of different kinds of substances that may be deposited on the seafloor. And ultimately, the resting spot for all sediments is the seafloor. And what happens to the seafloor? We only have seafloor that's about 190 million years old. That's the oldest seafloor we've been able to find. But we know the Earth is 4.6 billion years old. What happened to the rest of the seafloor? That's right, it was subducted. So eventually, all of this material that lands on the seafloor will end up in a subduction zone. And if you remember the accretionary wedges that I talked about in our previous lecture, that's also a place where sediments get deposited. But ultimately, all those sediments are going to be reworked and remelted, and we have what's called the sediment cycle. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a few minutes. OK, classifying marine sediments is one way to identify where they came from and one way to figure out how they got where we found them. Okay, so how were they formed? How did they get transported to that particular location, whether it's a lake or the edge of the sea or the deep sea? And what happened when they came to rest in that particular location? So as described in the book, really scientists use three different types of classification schemes. One is just a descriptive classification. We just visually look at the sediments and say something about them. We may use a size classification. So how big are the sediments? What can we tell about that? And then there are a whole bunch of other properties, uh, something called the genetic classification. The genetic classification really is a series of tools designed to figure out exactly where the sediments came from. We're not going to talk too much about that, but we will take a look at descriptive and size classifications.